uh, children ages four and five can be dismissed to the back there for Children's Church. And the rest of you can open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter five. We're in Matthew chapter five, verse nine today. I'm going to tell you something that I learned this week. In 1968, there were two historians, Will and Ariel Durant, who published a book called The Lessons of History, which I think is probably a very valuable book today, something maybe we ought to read. But chapter 9 in that book focuses on the history of war, the history of war. And they begin that chapter with, with something that I feel is fairly startling, but not all that surprising. Uh, they say that war is one of the constants of history, and it does not diminish with civilization or with democracy. And they go on to say that in the last nearly 3,500 years of recorded history, only 268 years have seen no war. Out of 3,500 years, only 268 years have seen no war. That means something like 92 and a half percent of that time, of those last 3,500 years, have seen active war, which is a massive massive amount. Again in 1968, there was another publication about war. There was a, a major news publication that reported that there had been, from just about, I think, 30 years before Jesus was born, up to 1968, something like 14,553 recorded wars, which is something like seven, a little over seven wars per year, which is insane to me. Now, we look at that, and we, we, we can add in, you know, conflicts and, and the Indian Wars uh, in the United States. In our roughly 250-year history, we've only seen 20 years that did not have wars. That should shock you. I don't hear anything out there, but it should shock you a little bit, right? So it's been said that, that uh, peace is that glorious moment in history when everyone just stops to reload. That's what it is. It's said that, that peace isn't really peace. We don't really know what peace is. We know what ceasefires are, and we know what a cold war is. We don't really know what peace is. Now, we go beyond the scope of war. We zoom in a little bit on, on internal strife and internal conflict. You know, you can't turn on the news right now and say that the U.S. is at peace internally, right? We don't have economic peace, we don't have religious peace, we don't have social peace, we don't have uh, racial peace. There, there is no end to the marches and the demonstrations and the riots and, and the protests. We zoom in just a little bit further than that in our homes, and we see that most homes in the United States do not have peace. They, these are not harmonious families. We consider the church. The church, at one place in all the world that ought to have peace reigning in it, and oftentimes what we find, our members are, are warring against each other. There's conflict in the church, and there's very little peace out there personally. There's very little personal peace out there. The fact of the matter is, the order of the day, for most of us, is conflict, and we have had zero days without incident. And I would argue that there was probably only ever one time in, in, in all of history where we actually experienced peace, socially, economically, relationally, personally. And, and that was when there were only two people living in this world. It was all the way back at the beginning. You go all the way back to the, to the Garden of Eden, and you see peace there. But even that didn't last long. We get to chapter 3, and Adam and Eve blew it, right? It's gone. It's over with. The Bible opens with peace in the Garden of Eden, and by God's good grace, because of God's good grace, it closes with, with peace in the end, in the new Jerusalem, in the coming heaven, but everything in between is marked, and it is marred by chaos and conflict and sin and depravity, right? One thing we should be able to see from history, from scripture, from human experience is that peace does not characterize man's earthly existence. It just doesn't. Where man is, there is war, there is conflict, there is discord. That's just the way it goes. And the reason for this is twofold. We have the opposition of Satan, and we have the disobedience of man. Those two things go hand in hand here. John MacArthur, I believe, is the one who wrote that the fall of the angels and the fall of man established a world without peace. Satan and man are engaged with the God of peace for a battle of sovereignty. 
a battle for sovereignty. And I'd call that pretty accurate. I'd say John MacArthur nailed it right there. He's, he's 100% right. And, and we can look at Scripture, we can look at our text this morning and know that Jesus saw this too. Jesus, he didn't, of course he was aware of the conflict and the war and, and what creation has become. Better than anyone, in fact. Better than anyone. He sees our combative nature. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, he tells us to do better. He says in our beatitude of study this morning, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Now this is the seventh beatitude that we're studying. The seventh one, next week is our last one. This is the the last beatitude though that, that describes the character of a Christian, the character of a believer, of a follower of Christ. This is Jesus calling his people, calling us to a very particular mission, a very particular character to help restore peace in this world. He calls us to be peacemakers, calls us to be peacemakers. And peace is one of the dominant ideas in Scripture. It's referenced directly in the pages of Scripture something like 400 times. It's referenced indirectly in the pages of Scripture far more than that even. But God urges us to negotiate peace, to pursue peace, to make peace, and to live in peace. And this peace, God's peace, what he's talking about, has nothing to do with politics or militaries. It has nothing to do with church councils or truces or treaties. You know, when the angels announced peace on earth the night that Jesus was born, it had nothing to do with the absence of conflict. God's peace has a greater definition than man's peace, a far greater definition. So that's where we're going to start this morning. If we are to be peacemakers, we ought to know what peace God is calling us to. What does he mean by this? And this first meaning of peace is the presence of rest. He's talking about the presence of of rest. This is an inner peace. The, The Greek word that's used for peace in peacemaker is eirene or eirene. And it literally means rest or tranquility. It means the exemption of rage and havoc of all the things that are going on around us. That's one of the defining marks of this peace. In other words, there should be a stillness in you that is, that is just untouchable, untouchable, an inner peace that is untouchable for you. It shouldn't matter what's going on around you. It shouldn't matter what's going on in your town or in your church or in your home. Your resolve with the Lord is strong. That's what we're talking about here. And, you know, we will get some of the ricochet of anger. We'll get shrapnel when somebody throws a grenade out there, that's for sure. But you are secure. You are still. You are calm with the peace of our God. You are resting in Him and resting in His salvation. It's untouchable. This is the peace we have. We're told to be still and know God, rest in Him and His goodness. And we'll cover that a little bit more next week. I don't feel I have to dwell any further really into that one. We'll we'll dwell on that more next week. The second mark of peace that we need to look at is the presence of righteousness. And this is the really important one, the presence of righteousness. Remember, I think it was probably about four weeks ago, we talked about how we need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. That was the fourth beatitude that we covered. And, and, and basically, I, I think I gave you this chart. Uh, there are the, those first three beatitudes listed off there to the left. Those are our beatitudes of need. They show us our need. They show us our emptiness. And those beatitudes go into the machine of righteousness, which fill us up, right? And then they come out the other end in action, and peacemaking is, is part of that action. It's part of that overflow of righteousness. It's an action that requires righteousness. Peace is, is more than just the absence of conflict. It's more than the absence of strife, which is how we would typically define peace as, as men. It's, it's the presence of righteousness is what it is. Because men can stop fighting without righteousness, but we cannot live peaceably without it. We cannot live peaceably without righteousness. Psalm 85, I believe, 85 verse 10, uh, tells us just how closely these two things are related. The, the psalmist says uh, righteousness and peace kiss each other. They are, they're, they're basically inseparable is, is what the psalmist means. They're inseparable things. And I want you to see something with me. There's a word that gets used for peace in, in, in the Hebrew that is uh, shalom. And it's a greeting that wishes 
for one's peace. It wishes for your peace. People would say it to each other, and, and basically, it's an expression uh, that, that communicates one's desire to have the one that they're talking to be filled with righteousness and goodness, all of it that, that God can give. It's a, it's a wonderful wish. It bears the idea of wholeness and overall well-being. It is, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to say to somebody. One author wrote that, uh, that when a Jew said shalom, he was wishing another more than the absence of trouble, but all that made for a, com- a complete whole life. That is what shalom means. It's essentially God's highest good for you. If I say shalom to you, it's shalom peace, God, God's highest good for you. It's, it's taking that, that inner peace that we have in Jesus, the inner peace that we have in our salvation, and, and wishing it for others and, and more, right? It's applying that, that A or N A to our relationships. It's moving that inner peace outward. Now, we're going to work this out from from large scale to small, because I think this is the best way to see this. Do you think we, as a nation, as America, ever really wish shalom peace on any of our adversaries? I mean, do you think that our government looks to the Chinese or the Russian or the Iranian governments and, and says, you know, I hope, I hope that you are just blessed, you know, God's highest good for you. I hope he blesses you beyond all measure. There's no way, there's no way that our government thinks that about or wishes that upon any other government, right? And they don't wish that upon us either, right? We deal with each other pretty underhandedly as countries, I think. I mean, we, we, we never really trust each other. We've got spies all over the place. We've got our spies there. They've got their spies here. There's always this high level of cynicism. There's always this high level of distrust. There's always these escalating tensions that we're just trying to appease and, and make better. But by man's definition, by man's definition, we're at peace just because we're not shooting each other right now. Now, apply this to your front porch. Think about the people you struggle with. Are you at peace with them? Are you at peace just because you're not currently hurling insults or throwing fists at them? Are you at peace because you swept stuff under the rug? I mean, those are, those are hard questions to answer, but I, I can tell you, not really. You're not really at peace if, if, those, if that's the way you define peace. Because until disagreement is resolved, conflicts don't actually go away. We know that they go underground and they fester and they grow until they break out again down the road. And if you don't believe me, go to your next family reunion. You'll find that out, right? Some of us come loaded for bear and just wait for somebody to light the fuse. That's the way it is at our house every year for Christmas. Every year. Mom says, no politics when we walk in the house. And my dad just sits there and waits for somebody to bring something up. And he's all over it. But God's peace not only stops the hostilities, it not only, it not only stops the hostilities, but settles the issues, and it brings, God's peace brings the parties together in mutual love and in harmony. Where you look at them and you wish God's highest good for them. That's what we ought to be doing for others, wishing God's highest good for them. And it takes a righteous person to be this way. It takes a righteous person to be that way. By God's definition, peace cannot be attained at the expense of righteousness. They have to go hand in hand. Two people cannot be at peace until they recognize and they resolve the wrong attitudes and and, and the wrong actions that caused the conflict between them in the first place and then bring themselves to God for, for cleansing, for righteousness, for purity, which is what we talked about last week. Where there is true peace, there is righteousness. So essentially having peace is living in God's righteousness, living in his, his highest good for you and genuinely seeking that for others too. Now, if that's what peace is, how do we make peace? I mean, we're called to be messengers of peace, the messengers of peace. So what is a peacemaker? I could tell you first what it is not. A peacemaker is not an appeaser. That is not what peacemaking is. We aren't called to be people who, who give in and to just compromise just to, to put the issue to bed or, or make someone happy or avoid further conflict. A peacemaker is not a pacifist, somebody who avoids conflict altogether. 
A peacemaker is not a peacekeeper. Those two things are different. It's good to be a peacekeeper, but it's even better to be a peacemaker. And a peacemaker is not somebody who's apathetic, who just doesn't care. You know, as long as whatever's going on around me doesn't affect me, I'm not going to deal with it. That's kind of the easiest route, I think. But that's not what a peacemaker is. Peacemaking is much more important than these things. It's much more important, and it's much more difficult. I'll start with saying this. Peacemakers must be filled with gospel peace. Something we kind of already just touched on. Peacemaking is not a natural human quality. It's, it's, it's above us. It is above our human nature. It's got to be given to us first. Peace must be given to us first. We must have a profound experience with the peace of God, Him making peace with us before we can go anywhere else with it, right? We cannot give what we do not possess. We have to, we have, to have that in our lives. I would say that, that this is kind of the connection to the previous beatitude, being pure in heart. Christ calls for, His call for peacemaking demands a renovation of the human heart that there is peace in us. We must know His peace before we, we take it with us. Now, the other, another thing that a peacemaker must be is characterized by honesty. This is a hard one right here. Ezekiel warns against people who act like everything is great when really everything is not great. Against those who say peace when there is no peace, as Scripture says, who, who just plaster over the cracks. The plaster covers the cracks until the rain comes, and then everything crumbles is what he says. The peacemaker must truthfully admit when and where there is a problem, where there is a conflict. R. Kent Hughes says it this way, the peacemaker must be painfully honest about the true status of relationships in the world, in the society in which he moves, and in his own personal dealings. He admits to failed relationships. He's real about being at odds with others, and he recognizes that there is no peace there. He recognizes the tension. The, the peacemaker does not pretend, cannot pretend. He does not say peace, peace, where there is no peace. Now, how does that land in your life? How does that land for you? Part of the, the, the purpose of these Beatitudes is for us as believers to look at them and to evaluate our lives in regard to those. You know, how am I doing? Where am I at spiritually in this regard, right? Are you honest? Are you honest about the tensions that you have in your relationships? Do you acknowledge the conflict that is around you? Are you honest about it with yourself? Can you look at the situation for what it is truly and then speak truth into it? Because we have to do that. We're called to do that. Peacemakers will need to do that. And it's going to be hard sometimes. It's not always going to go well. Rarely does it, I think. But sometimes truth makes people feel like garbage before they let it heal, right? If they even let it heal. It's like a surgeon's scalpel. You kind of got to cut past the exterior and get into the, to where the sin still remains. You got to get there. It'll hurt. It may even produce anger at first in those that we're, that we're dealing with. But if you think about it, you don't slap a Band-Aid on a heart wound. It doesn't make sense. You go in, you deal with the problem. The temptation for us to just putty over the cracks is real. To put a Band-Aid on it, it's real. But it's not being honest about the gravity of friction, of conflict, of discord, uh, uh, even of hatred. So being a peacemaker is being honest. This is an, uh, I love this one. Peacemakers must be fighters. How's that for a paradox? Peacemakers must be fighters, but it's all about divine aggression. There's a difference between human aggression and divine aggression. Human aggression wages war. Divine aggression wages peace. It fights for peace. If you and I are called to make peace, by the way, it should be noted that we are going to where peace is not. We have to go where there is no peace. Places where peace is absent, right? The firefighter goes to the fire to extinguish it, to put out the fire. The soldier runs toward the battle with the intent to end the battle, to make peace there. The peacemaker goes into the trouble with the intent to wage peace, to extinguish the trouble. And it's hard. You know, it's hard enough to keep the peace. It's even harder to make peace where it is 
not. Where peace is absent, you and I, believers, we must be willing to go. We have to. And it looks different all the time. I love what St. Francis says of this. He says, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hate, may I bring love. Where offense, may I bring pardon. May I bring union in the place of discord. And I'm going to, if you turn to the back of your bulletin inserts, um, I included something here that I, is helpful for me. I hope it's helpful for you. This is the best place I could think to put this, uh, 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 basically a guide to peacemaking, where we're going to find those places of unrest and what God tells us to do in those places of unrest. And that first place that turmoil, that unrest develops is in our own personal relationships. That's for sure. You know it, and I know it. We can have conflict between our friends, conflict with our uh, family members, with our spouses, uh, co-workers, brothers and sisters in Christ, just about any random relationship. We, we're good at making war with anybody. And we're told in Scripture to be aggressive about it. When we find those areas of conflict in our lives, be aggressive. And what it means, what, what we're talking about is be aggressive toward peace. Scripture says, let us pursue what makes peace and for mutual building. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We are to be aggressively peaceful. We are to seek out that issue and deal with it. Now, another place that unrest develops is between others that are around us. When our friends are fighting, when our family members are fighting, and we're not really involved in it. But I'm going to tell you, I'm not so sure that Scripture ever gives us the green light to just ignore those things. To ignore those fights and say, that's your problem, you deal with it, I'm out. You know, I, I, don't, I don't need to get involved here. No, Scripture tells us many times we need to be involved in those places, right? In the book of James, James calls out some people who are fighting. He feels the need to, to call them out, to get involved, right? Paul, in the middle of uh, uh, Philemon and Onesimus' is spat. I mean, Onesimus stole from Philemon and ran away. And Paul says, well, let me help you to restore this. Jesus had to, had to many times get in the middle of his disciples' squabbles. But I love this. I think this is pretty clear. Paul, when he's writing to the, to the Corinthians, sees a problem and he says, can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle the, the dispute between you? between brothers. He's implying you have to get involved. There must be a third party that gets involved to settle this, right? When he writes to, to the church in Philippi, there's two women who are fighting, and evidently it's a big enough brawl that he hears about it from miles and miles away, and he says, he, he says, I entreat these women to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true companion, help these women whose names are written in the book of life. Help them get involved. Get involved. I think peacemakers have a responsibility to bring peace to situations like this where the peace is not. Unrest is certainly found in tragedy. We know that. We talked about this a couple, a couple weeks ago, I believe, where you know, peace is rarely found. It's rarely present when we deal with the loss of a loved one, when we deal with the ending of a marriage, when we lose, when we lose our homes, whatever it is, there's, there's tragedy in there, and it's hard to find peace in that. Peacemakers are needed in the darkest hours of someone's life. How awful, how awful would it be if the church ever decided that they just need to abandon those people, abandon those problems, right? We're told in 1 Peter to be sympathetic. That's the thing. That's, the, that's what we're told to be, sympathetic. All of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Paul tells us, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Enter into that with them. Be with them in their tragedy. Be sympathetic. And one other place that we know unrest comes is in our own private, personal lives where nobody else is concerned where nobody else has to be involved, where we war in our own minds and in our own hearts. Sometimes peace is absent in our personal struggles, in our spiritual struggles, when we have doubts, when we feel lost, when discouragement just nails us up to the wall. 
And we need someone to speak peace back into our lives, to encourage us, to remind us who we are as, as children of the Lord, right? Filling us up, loving us, and walking us back to health. You need that in your personal struggles. I need that in my personal struggles. And so we're told to be encouraging. We're told to be encouraging to one another. And for those who are struggling, to be encouraged by others, right? Encourage one another and build one another up. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. As peacemakers, we fight for peace in those areas. In these ways, we wage peace in our own lives and in the lives of those who are around us. We bring peace to where it is absent. That is our goal. That is our job. That is what Christ tells us to be doing. So we must be doing that. But peacemakers must be willing to get stung in the process. When you go to these places where peace isn't, pretty much it's like kicking a hornet's nest sometimes. And we don't like to do that. We don't want to do that. Because there's a good likelihood we're going to get lit up in the process. When I was serving at my previous church, we had a missionary uh, who, he was a young guy. We gave that missionary, I think it was at least twice as much as any other missionary. He served 45 minutes away at a, a fairly liberal school. And it came to my attention just in talking with him that he was, um, he became less of a gospel teacher and more of a social justice warrior. And I struggled with this. You know, his messages began to include some very divisive language to his students. And before long, he was embracing and promoting some very anti-biblical views. And so I thought, well, I need to bring this to the leadership. I, I, you know, our, my, our pastor needs to be aware of this. And the pastor set some, some goalposts. He drew a line and says, as long as, as long as he doesn't cross this line, we're just not going to do anything about it. I thought, okay, you know, I'll, I'll rest on it. That's fine. But before long, that missionary crossed that line in a very big way. And I had to bring it back to the leadership. And this is, you know, they said, well, his family, we're not going to do anything about it because his family gives an awful lot of money to the church. And he literally says, we're not going to kick that hornet's nest. And I thought, man, man, that's the moment I knew that's probably not the church for me anymore. I just, as leaders who were not willing to do the hard things because they were afraid of what was going to happen next. Believers, we, we, don't, we don't have that luxury. We don't have that luxury. We are called to have the hard conversations. We're called to do difficult things. We're called to go into uneasy places, for sure to make peace. And we risk the sting of failure in our attempts to make peace. That hurts. It always hurts when we try to make peace with someone and it just isn't going to happen. Sometimes that's just the case. We risk the sting of failure. We shoulder the sting of rebuking others and their sin. That's another thing that we're called to do. That's part of making peace. When we see someone, a brother or a sister, not living a righteous life, not living the life they're called to live, and we have to approach them and say, hey, listen, you know, we, I, I see your struggle. How can I help you? Let's, let's get you back on the right path. It doesn't feel good to have to rebuke people. And we feel the sting of repentance when we mess up, when we sin. Repenting can be a really hard thing. I mean, we have to, we're, we're forced to, to come face to face with our failures and our sin, and that doesn't ever feel good. But this is all a part of, of peacemaking. It's all a part of peacemaking. Now the final thing that I want to talk about in regard to this passage that Jesus teaches his people is the maker of peace. Jesus says that peacemakers shall be called sons of God. And this is my favorite reward of all the rewards listed in the Beatitudes. This one's my favorite. I, they're all good. They're all wonderful. But this one hits a certain way for me. Jesus is very, very specific in what he says here. Very specific. The word that's commonly used for children or child is technon. The word he used here is huios. Jesus uses this word for sons. Technon and, technon, excuse me, and huios both speak of, of the believer's relationship with and, and to God, but technon is a term of affection and endearment. This term, huios, expresses the dignity and the honor of the relationship of a child to his parent. 
And the magnificence in this particular wordage that we find here in this passage is this. Sons of God refers to character. It refers to our character. Peacemakers partake in the character of God. Much like somebody can, you know, my wife will often look at me and say, you are your father's son, right? And I take it as a compliment. I don't know what she means by it for sure. And I say, you act like your mother and it's over, right? There is no peace. I don't think she's in here, so we're good. <laughs> but you have, you have some, you know, it's kind of like that expression, um, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You have some character resemblance of your parents, and that's what we're talking about here. That's what we're talking about. Being a peacemaker, being peacemakers, by being peacemakers, you're resembling the Father. You're resembling God. You are showing that you belong to him and he is claiming you as his, as his child, as his son or his daughter. And God is the ultimate peacemaker. He's the ultimate peacemaker. Consider what he has done. Consider it. He saw his creation at war. He saw our wicked hearts working out our wicked ways on his earth. And he chose to get involved. He chose, he, he went right in and kicked the hornet's nest, didn't he? He got crucified, for goodness sake, he was crucified. But in that, he brought peace. He reconciled man to himself. He brought me peace. Those who believe, I, I, have, I have peace with God where at one time I did not. And it's because he made that. He made that peace between us. And he will bring an ultimate peace and eternal peace someday. We look forward to that day where there will be no more conflict on earth. There's a book, I think maybe published in the 60s or 70s, it's called Peace Child by a a missionary, uh, Don Richardson. And in this book, he talks about his horrible struggles, his horrible struggles to bring the gospel to the cannibalistic uh, Sawi tribe in Indonesia. Uh, He spent a long time trying to get these people to understand the gospel, specifically Christ's atoning death for them. They just, they wouldn't get it. They they couldn't grasp it. And the problem was these these Sawi villages, there were several villages with this tribe. They were constantly warring. And unfortunately, they, they found a lot of honor. Their culture honored treachery and murder and revenge. They would persuade people to become their friends, and then they would turn on them, they would kill them, and they would eat them. Yeah, right? That's sick, right? And that it was, but it was like a ritual between the tribes. When, that, when one tribe did that to somebody of another tribe, the, the, the tribe that has lost a member, their response is now to plot out their revenge, and who are they going to persuade? How are they going to kill them? It was this strange thing. They, had a, they have a name for it. I don't remember what the name is, but it's, it's nuts to me. But th- when this, when Don Richardson was, was bringing them the gospel, they overlooked Jesus and they thought Judas was the hero of the story. That's how screwed up they were. But they had this legendary custom, a very important custom. And one, if one village gave a baby boy to another village, peace would prevail between those two villages until that, that peace child passed away. So if that child grew to be 80 years old, there would be 80 years of peace between those villages. It's called the peace child. And this missionary, Don Richardson, he capitalized on that idea. He thought, oh my goodness, you know, how did I, how did I miss this? And he used it as an analogy for the work of Jesus. He told them that Jesus is God's divine peace child that he offers to man. And because Christ lives eternally, his peace will never end. And it turns out, it took a little while, but it turns out that analogy was the key that unlocked the gospel for the Sawis. And it centered all on peace and what it means to have a biblical peace. And many of these people, many of the people of these tribes came to a saving faith. They, they planted an evangelistic church that had developed there, and, and peace came to them. They became peacemakers. When something came up between the tribes, it wasn't about revenge anymore, and it wasn't about, you know, whose child can we give to make peace here? Instead, they prayed to the God of peace, and they remembered 
Christ as the peace child. May we be of the same mind and of the same heart as these people. So the question is, are you a peacemaker? Are you a son or a daughter of God? Do you know his peace in your life and do you seek to deliver that peace to those who do not have it? The person who is not willing to disrupt and disturb in God's name cannot be a peacemaker. Being a peacemaker is the result of a holy life. It's the result of a holy life and the call to others to embrace holiness. May the Lord guide us to be peacemakers. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good to give us this opportunity this morning to come and to worship you, to sing our, our songs of praise to you, to be able to pray to you and bring our, our needs to you, and, and also to hear from your word. We thank you for the peace that you've given us as believers, the peace that you've provided through your Son. We thank you for the peace that's, that, that's worked out in us through the Holy Spirit as we seek to, to bring it into the world, as we reap the, the fruit of peace. Lord, may you give us boldness to be peacemakers. Would you give us boldness to address our own relationships where there is no peace, to address the relationships around us where there is no peace? Would you give us boldness to, to go into the hard places of, of tragedy and loss and speak your peace back into the lives of, of those who are struggling, Lord? And, and would you remind us to be encouragers who bring peace and in, in, in into people's personal lives. And Lord, if, if we're one struggling, if there's someone in this room struggling on their own who needs to be encouraged and we just don't see it, give them the boldness to reach out, reach out to somebody that, that can encourage them and be a part of their lives and walk them back to health. Lord, we thank you for these opportunities. We know that you give us hard things because, because it, it's, it's part of following you. You have done hard things. You've done difficult things, and you want us to be of the same mind. You want us to, to be true followers of you, and so, Lord, give us boldness as we seek to do that. It's in your name we pray. Amen.